program? No, right? You have to assume, I mean, unless you have right access to the server, in which case you're in for a fun time. Um, otherwise, you have to assume you can't change the code that's running on the server. Does query parameters? Query parameters? Uh, that's your input, but what is the actual mixing of code and data? What does that mean? Like, not necessarily in web. We've talked about this before. On the stack? Yeah, so what, what code and data is mixed on the stack? Yeah, so fundamentally, right, on the stack you have the data, right? That's where the user wants to store their data. There's also the control flow information of where to jump back after you execute this program. So essentially, I mean, it's not really code in there, but there is the code flow of the program is left on the stack. Yeah? Was an example like using MySQL with PHP example of data and code? Or that be all considered code? All considered code, kind of, yeah be like HTML that contains JavaScript code in one. <laughs> HTML that contains JavaScript code? Maybe, yes. I think we'll get to it later. Yeah. So the the pointers in the on the stack are are data values in in a <coughs> in memory, but they're also code themselves. Is that what you mean when you say that? Um not quite. So here the canonical uh, what we originally talked about, I know it seems like forever ago, at the very beginning of the class, we talked about um, Captain Crunch and his magic whistle. So the phone network, the voice, your voice transmission, was the same line that they would use to send, essentially, code of how to program and send the call. So that by sending certain frequencies, you could change and alter how your call was routed, or you could make it so that you got this call for free. So this was the, um, so this is, you have the same channel, you're mixing the user's data with essentially control signals or code, which causes this problem. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of the, the first instance of that. And web applications have a lot of areas where you have this mixing of code and data, and we've pointed out a lot of good ones, right? So we've pointed out that the JavaScript code, right, the HTML page that's delivered to the app, to your browser, right? That HTML 
is essentially you can think of as data, right? I mean, HTML is not really code, nothing's executing. The HTML just tells the browser how to interpret and parse things, right? But the JavaScript code is code now that's running on your browser. Right? And these are mixed and they're sent in the same channel all in one HTML page. Uh, similarly, so basically the way to think about this is anywhere that strings are concatenated together in order to produce output to another program or parser. So in the case of JavaScript, you have a web application that's concatenating strings together to build the HTML output to send. Right? And so if an attacker can control one of those inputs and the inputs aren't sanitized, they can control um, what code is, is executed. Uh, similarly, as we'll see with SQL queries, if the application builds a SQL query by concatenating strings together, right, we will see that we can maybe try to control that query because we're essentially just building up a string that we're passing to a SQL parser to try to get a SQL parser to get. So all types of areas, so even HTTP. So in HTTP, we have the user's uh, data, like e in that same TCP stream, we have the headers of the HTML, which can be thought of as the code in some sense. And then we have the data of the request or the response. Uh, HTML, SQL queries, command line, as we'll see. Uh, SMTP, so this is another interesting one, when sending out emails. Uh, you can trick sometimes the SMTP server to execute uh, essentially control the headers and alter the email that's being sent. So the first one we're going to look at are classic OS command injection at attacks. So where did we look at these for binaries? What was the idea here? Well, we didn't call it OS command injection because we're on an operating system. What was the idea here? somewhere where you can execute it, and then you move the uh, command pointer, or the, the program pointer to that code. So that's for uh, exploiting a buffer overflow and giving your shell code to execute. Yeah, so, so command injection is different, yeah. Is it related to set your binaries? Is it related? It's all related to set your binaries, so yes. Yeah. Uh, is this for web applications? This is for web applications. We're talking about for binaries. We looked at one that's applicable to binaries, yeah. Yes, so just like we talked about on binaries, right, if the application calls system using your input, you can inject using backticks, right, to get it to execute arbitrary commands. Similar thing happens on web applications, right, which makes sense because you're writing an application, you don't want to have to redo functionality, so if you need to, let's say, grep for something in a file, well, just call the grep function using the system command, right? The problem is, if the, if the web application is not filtering that input, if the user can do things like backticks or something like that, they can get um, code execution and execute arbitrary commands on the client. And essentially this is the same thing happening again, right? We're building up a string in our web application, which we're gonna pass essentially to bash, which tries to parse it, right? And so if we can trick it to parse and execute different commands by using the bar or backticks or dollar sign uh, parenthesis, right? Then we can uh, get it to evaluate code. So system, eval, popen, include, all this cool stuff, require. So the implementation would look like this. So this is something that would be normal, right? This would be, it's under, it's, I'm, don't want to demonize any of the developers because it's understandable to write code that looks like this, right? You're calling system, you're grepping on a file because you're trying to look for some phone book article. So, of course, the attacker can do anything, right? They could mail themselves their, your EDC password file, right? What are they limited to? Can they do anything? Character count for the Possibly character count for the application? Who's executing this code? The web server. So the permissions that we have on this application are that whatever permissions the web server has, or the web applications, which depends on your installation, maybe www-data, I think, is the default on a uh, Right? 
But if we think about it from our perspective, right? We're accessing a web application, which means we're remote to that system, right? We don't have a user account on that system. We can't SSH into it like we did in homework three, right? We just have a web interface. And so from that web interface, we can now execute arbitrary commands to get us onto that system. And then when we're on there, we can maybe use a privilege escalation attack to try to get to root access on that machine and try to access the set UID binary. So in the web context, we don't really care about accessing set UID binaries because essentially we're, access, we're acting as a remote user. All right, so if they do this, are we, are, is this safe? Super safe? Why or why not? not safe because you could still just inject quotes to separate out the, the data and then put your command in there and carry on. Exactly. So we can put, we can have the start of our input be a double quote, which would match the other double quote, and we can do semicolon that whatever we want. What do we have to worry about? Open double quote. The open double quote at the end, right? The important thing to remember when all, with all these strange concatenation things is whatever comes after us will always be appended. Right? So we need to make sure we handle that double quote bombo.txt. Cool. So we can still do this, right? Now we just pass double quotes there. So now if we do it like this, is it safe? What's the difference? I think the, the key is it depends on what the semantics are of the system call, of the, the system, literally not system call, but this call to the system function, right, in this programming language. So I believe PHP, essentially what it'll do is exactly what you said. So basically we've pre-parsed all the arguments to this program. So it's not going to be, uh, so no matter what, we parse and pass in as the expression, there's no way we can alter the parsing of the program. So you can think about it, what the system call is actually going to, going to do is it's going to call exec VE with the arguments of RV0 is going to be grep, RV1 will be E, RV2 will be our expression, RV3 will be phonebook.txt. So there's absolutely no parsing that's going on in here. So therefore, it doesn't matter what characters we pass in for expression. So there's no shell parsing involved at all. So this is important when you're trying to find, uh, because as you know, web applications can be written in any language, right? So <coughs> you may have to go in and say, okay, this looks like a kind of weird call to system. Is it actually parsing it? Is it doing shell parsing or not? So you need to look up the documentation to understand how it's being used, what's the secure way or the not secure way. So, Preventing this, it comes back to sanitization. So this is something we've been preaching for a while. Never trust outside input. I feel like we've hammered this a lot, so this is good. Right? But you have to do it in all of these important contexts, right? That you can't, uh, never, not trusting outside input. Uh, languages will provide built-in sanitization for this. So you should use, in PHP, there's this escape shell R. But it's very important to read the exact semantics of each of these functions so you know exactly what it's expecting and what it expects and what it prevents, right? Because the question is, when you call this function, can you put it inside double quotes? Can you not? Will it already add quotes? Will it not? Right? So you need to know the exact semantics. Otherwise, you can have something that looks safe but actually is not. Um, so you have to know that in PHP's escape shell R, add single quotes around the string and quotes escapes any existing single quotes. So you can pass it directly to a shell function, but you don't have to put extra quotes around it. So there's a difference, right? So there's another one, escape shell command. 
escapes any characters that might use a trick or shell command to execute it. Um, so there's different ones and they have different kind of semantics that you need to understand. Other ways we can try executing code. So why do we want to execute code? What was that? Yeah, so we're trying to escalate our privileges, right, from a remote attacker to a local attacker, get some kind of access onto the system that we can try to explore further. Okay, so we already saw in PHP there's a mechanism that allows people to include code, the ha uh, the include and require function. Other web applications have similar types of inclusion mechanisms. And if the application is configured incorrectly, we may be able to inject attack code directly into the application. And there's actually multiple different ways to do this. So one way is if you can upload files to the system, and let's say, let's talk about PHP, but Apache by default, if you have PHP installed, any file that ends with .php in your web directory will be interpreted as PHP code and executed. Uh, so you can upload code that's included. Um, if you can control the parameter to the include function, and let's say you can't specify the exact name of the file that you're uploading. You can upload the file which has PHP code in it. Then if you can control the input function, then you can point that to your, fun uh, to your uploaded code. And it doesn't matter that, uh, that this code doesn't have a .php extension. So PHP will still try to read it and execute that code. Uh, as we saw, so PHP has that functionality. Uh, was it allow URL F open? to allow opening remote files. So if you control the parameter to an include or require, you can put a URL, which is points to your server, which outputs PHP code, which will then be downloaded and executed on the server. You may be able to, using classic dot dot attacks, influence the path that's used to locate the code. So in PHP, so this allow URL F open is the one that I just mentioned that allows URLs to be used. So you can do something like this. So if you have in your main app, you have an include path, you include some include path.library.php, which seems fine. In library.php, you're including include path.map.php. So here we require, so this is an example that, are, that shows two different things. So one is this problem of allowing um, auto creation of global variables in PHP. So because I can access library.php directly, I can specify any value I want for include path on the URL as a query parameter. So now I can force it to get and download code of my choosing. So what will this do if I make a get request to this include slash library.php include path equals http colon slash slash evil.com? What's the PHP code on the server going to do? What file is it going to request? What's that? Yes. So if I create a text file called map, or I mean, a file that my server does not interpret as PHP but outputs the PHP source code at my location, math.php that code will be fetched by the server, downloaded and executed. So I can include a remote shell, I can do, now I'm executing with whatever permissions the web application has. Okay. Seems like an abrupt transition. Greg, quick question. Yes. You, you said modulo, mod, modularize. What do you mean by that word? Did I? Uh, probably when we're talking about making into modules. Oh, yeah. So rather than having one giant PHP file, you split out the functionality into different modules and different files that you can include. All right, good question. So I don't think I said that. Okay. So now we get to SQL injection. So. We'll look at a form, a basic form, username and password form. We've all seen something like this. 
right? We can look and remember when we're testing these things, we can see it. We can always see the HTML of the page. So you should always be when you're testing these things, be looking at the HTML of the page. So here I have a form of action at login.asp. I have a method that's post. In there I have a table because I'm using terrible table-based layouts. I have a username, an input text field, a password with an input password field, a, and a submit button and a reset button. So already just for this one request, what can I tell? Probably an ASP application, right? It's something that's interesting. Cool. So now if we look at that code on the back end, we can see that there's a login function. And it, so now we're practicing uh, reading other languages just to try to understand what they're doing, right? We kind of have to Remember that the exact syntax will be different, but the semantics are all kind of the same, and if you don't know anything, you can always look it up, right? Um, so here we have a variable username, which is getting from the request form of username, so this makes sense, request.form is probably the form that got submitted. Password is request.form password. Then we create some server object, and we may not know exactly what this is, but now we can see, oh, a SQL query, this is interesting. So we create a variable called SQL where we are selecting from pubs.guest.sa underscore table where username is equal to username and password equal to password. And from SQL, so why are we including the username and password in single quotes? Yeah, because it's, we want to include all of the user's data, right? So if you think about it, in the case of a SQL query, Right? The data that we're passing to this query is what the developer wants to have happen in single quotes. Right? And everything else is essentially the code of the query, which specifies semantics about the query that we're trying to execute. Right? We're trying to get, select everything from the guest table, where the username is this and the password is this. We haven't even seen the rest of this page, but what is it probably doing? What's it going to do with this result? What's that? Run the, string, run, the query. run the query and then what? Yeah, probably check to see if we actually are a user in this system, right? This is a classic login form, right? Well, it's actually a bad one because they're just using the password directly, not doing hashing and all that stuff, but we, we're not going to get into that. So we can see they open a query to the database, they use this open. So now we can kind of infer, okay, this RSO must be some way to access the database in ASP. It's passing the connection of passing the login. It's performing the query. Then we're checking, hey, if the record set object, the RSO, if the record set object is empty, deny access. So record set close, and then output access denied. Otherwise, grant access and put access granted. Right, so ASP, similar to PHP, everything that's not within the parentheses uh, close tag is going to be output directly. So, super simple, right? But even something this simple, we have a core problem that an attacker can put arbitrary values here for username and password, right? And so, by changing and putting in the correct values, they may be able to change and alter the query that gets performed, right? So fundamentally, when you think about it, what is this function trying to do from a high-level perspective? Getting and yeah, but why? At a high level, what is it trying to do? Authentication. Trying to authenticate the user, exactly, right? It's trying to say that, hey, you can access the, at this application if you know a username and password. So we can check the database. The database has these users, usernames and passwords. So the thing we want to do is we want to be able to issue this query and get access to the system without what? 
a username and password, yeah, right? I mean, a username, yes, we want, you know, we can find a username, I think we've talked about that before. Uh, but fundamentally, we want to access it without a password. So, how can we do it? And why? Yeah. We can modify the query because we're not sanitizing the parameters we're putting in there. Yeah, so let's. I'm going to save this. So we can see fundamentally, right, the web application code is concatenating strings together in order to generate a SQL query that it then sends to the SQL server. And the SQL server does what when it receives this query? Before it executes it, what does the SQL query get? A sequence of bytes, right? So then what does it have to do? Parse it, it has to parse it to check if it conforms to the SQL language format, right? So it does lexing, parsing, generates the query that is intended to be executed, and then it executes it, right? So we think about it uh, once. Sorry, I need more. Parser, 
the SQL parser, when it generates, when it parses the input, will create the tree like this based on the syntax of the query, right? And so what's our goal again? Yeah, we want to be able to pass some input to the program that will allow us to log in without giving a username and password. So, how did the SQL engine know to parse this username, this the column on the left equals, and then this would be my input here. How did it know that? What is the exact syntax in the in the query that told them that? Yeah, username equals, and then whatever's in that single those single quotes, right? So we want to try to log in without. So what would happen? If I just pass in username, <coughs> foo, password, bar, am I going to get into the application? No, no that's not my access denied. <laughs> right? So if I type, I don't know, if I type something really large, like let's think buffer overflows, right? If I just keep typing forever, is that going to affect the application? No. no. My, the size of my input doesn't matter. So what, so the SQL server we can already see is using the single quote to delimit our input, right? So what if we put a tick in there, what would happen? So let's say our, our name was, let's say our name was uh, O'Malley. What's gonna happen? It's gonna be a what? A syntax, a SQL syntax error. Right, because if we think about what's the actual query that's going to be executed, right? We have this part. Right. So why is this invalid syntax? Yeah. So the problem is this single tick. The single quote is matching this other single quote, and this is not valid, so this other single quote probably is not valid SQL, yeah. So for SQL compiler, when SQL generates this decision tree, mm -hmm. can I increase the decision tree uh, where we have condition where uh, this and, and then it goes to either left or right, check these two values, uh, u equals u. If I can increase uh, the size of this decision tree, mm -hmm. Right, so the goal is, right, so when we put in huge input, right, I don't know what you're just saying, when we put in huge input, we're fundamentally not changing this parsing tree that we end up with, right? We're the, the parsing tree, the tree is still the same, but what if we, so here we have the tick, but the problem is we have this other tick, right? So you wanted to add another clause, what did you want to add? So let's do that, we'll do password. And so this is gonna be this, or two equals two, and password equals password. So what's gonna happen here? Syntax error, what syntax is the problem here? This final single quote. So what if we do, uh, let's see, we can add uh, and six egg equals six. So how does so does this change how we parse the select? Does it change how we parse the star? Does it change uh, the the from table? Why not? Yes, because everything before our input is essentially hard-coded, right? So this is a, another fundamental thing to understand about 
SQL injection is that we can't control anything before our you think about injection point in the query, right? All we can change is at that point what comes after. So we can see that we've changed to a new where clause, right? That has now uh, actually I don't know exactly how it's going to parse it, but let's say it's got two ands and an or, right? So we've essentially completely changed. This may be the or, and maybe and, and, right? So we fundamentally change this where clause by adding additional elements here. And this is the core root of a SQL injection vulnerability, is being able to alter the way that a SQL query is parsed, which seems like kind of a trivial thing to do. But, so, what is this going to do? What is the thing I'm worried about here? Yeah, I'm worried about this and password equals password, right? Because I'm not 100% sure exactly how SQL is going to parse the ors and the ands and what the precedence is and the precedence order. I'd have to test it out on my local SQL server to try out. I'd have to also make sure that I'm using the same server that the application I'm trying to test against is using so that I can test if my SQL parses it differently than Postgres or MSQL. Right, so. So what do we use? We had, where did we have this problem before? <coughs> of like injecting stuff and other stuff coming after us. So yeah, you'd have to look up uh, the exact documentation of the, the parsers. Cool. But this doesn't mean we can't use the other technique, right? We could maybe do this, and then maybe what can we do after that? Yeah, so fundamentally, like I said, once we're in here, Right? We're controlling the query at this point. We can't change the type of query that we had. We can't change what rows are, I mean, we can't change what table it's accessing. But depending on the system, we may be able to, let's say, uh, insert into users. Um, I could maybe create a new admin user. Something like that. So now 
depending on the, this again depends on the configuration of the server. Some servers and some programming language libraries will allow you to execute multiple queries like this separated by semicolons, some won't. But if you can, now I can insert arbitrary data into your database. Okay. So people don't usually use two equals two, even though it's exactly the same. Um, so this is called the tick or one equals one dash dash technique. This is a great name. <laughs> so we just saw this. Yeah, so this is actually a better way of showing the parsing, right? So the parser ignores everything else from a dash dash to the end of the line. Yeah. You mean the source code? Right. You may not have access to it. So how would we know what to do that? Yes, we'll talk about it. But yes, fundamentally you have to, and that's what makes web application testing so difficult, is because often you don't have access to the source code, so you have to come up with this, uh, black box ways to be able to test and figure that out. Uh, so we'll go over those. So we can actually use SQL injection. So this is the fundamental building block of SQL injection. We don't always have to do tick or one equals one. That may not be something that interests us, right? We may want to do other interesting things. Uh, we can, as we saw, inject SQL statements, insert statements. So if we can inject into this U, this U parameter of this value, we can then just create multiple users and maybe we can control those new values in some interesting way. Update, so we may be able to here update, this would be actually a really bad one. If there's a SQL injection vulnerability here with this password, we can change, we can drop this where clause and just set every single user's password to be equal to whatever something that we pass in, which would be fun. We can also target a specific user by adding a where clause to say where user ID is one or where username is equal to Adam or admin, whatever we want. Uh, delete statements, this would be very bad too. Why? Yeah, they can delete all of the users in your database, right? So fundamentally, and this is kind of the core problem here, is that the web application has permissions with the database to do essentially everything, right? Most web applications talk to the database and log in as a single user. Right? They're not logging in as you, they usually do their custom authentication and authorization. So the, data, the web application has more permissions to the database than your user has. And so now, with a SQL injection, you can fundamentally do anything to the database that, uh, that, the, that the web application itself could do. Uh, deleting is super, it's very bad. I, I probably don't have to reiterate that, but if you imagine how many Websites actually have good backup policies and backup functionality that works. For those of you that work, if you think, does your organization have a good backup policy in case your database gets deleted or hosed? Uh, yeah, a lot of times they're there, but uh, when stuff actually happens is when you find out, like, oh, we, we missed some bug and we haven't been capturing this data for months. Um, it's not a fun place to be in. So, we talked about, just very briefly, semicolons can be used to separate queries. Um, we can, so this, now if the SQL server and the web application framework allow this, now you have total control of the application. You can write arbitrary queries. So, how to identify SQL injection. So there's multiple ways to approach it. And it comes back to this idea of doing testing with the web application where you generate some theory or some hypothesis that says, hey, I think there could be a SQL injection vulnerability here. If I give this input, if there is a vulnerability, then I shouldn't see this output. So one way to do this is called the negative approach. So the idea is you try to get it to crash. So for instance, if you put a tick in for a user parameter and the web application gives you a 500 error, that likely means there's a SQL injection vulnerability there, or some kind of vulnerability there. So that's a fun thing to test of, of with that in there. I mean, in May, if you're lucky, the application will give you all of the error message. You'll get the whole error dump where 
PHP will tell you, hey, there's an error in your SQL syntax right here, and then it'll actually leak some of the SQL query for you. This is why it's always good practice on any web application to shut off all of those error messages. Um, the other way is a really interesting way, and this is much more stealthy. So the other way is a positive approach. So the idea is you, so for instance, usually where I see this is usually on blog type applications where there'll be an ID parameter that says which blog article to look at. And so usually there'll be one, two, three, right? And so if you make a request for, um, if you make a request for something with an ID of one plus one, right, and it gives you back the blog article that has ID two, you know that likely you've executed some SQL command there. And so that query is, is vulnerable to SQL injection. So this is kind of the two different approaches. There are two different ways to look at it. I basically do both. I mean, I try just throwing stuff in. I usually try overkill. I'll try like single quotes, double quotes, usually just try to get it to crash. And crash is always good. You start with a crash and then you build from there. So now, so it seems, I don't know. Does SQL injection seem bad? Yes. Why? Cause a lot of damage. Why? It can log you in. You can log in, bypass authentication. Insert into tables. Insert into tables. Insert into tables, add data, delete your data. But we didn't talk about how to get all of your data, right? Because we saw that the query that you execute, you're limited to only querying the table that's hard coded into that query. Right, so there's a SQL injection. Yeah, maybe you can change it to give you all the users, right, instead of just a specific user. But fundamentally, you still wanna be able to extract all the other tables, right? If there's one SQL injection vulnerability, I wanna be able to get your credit card table or your username password table and try to crack and break some passwords. So how you can actually do that comes to the union operator. So the union operator we briefly talked about for SQL is used to essentially merge the results of two queries, right? So you have your first select query, and then you have a union with a second select query to add the results of that query to the first one. So something like this. Select repeat A1, union select repeat B10. So this will return A followed by, I think, 10 Bs. And that will be what's actually returned here. So this is exactly what we're looking for. Right? We wanted something that would come after our injection point. Right? We can't change the first part of the select statement, but we can inject a union operator followed by another select statement in order to try to query another table. So if the original query is select ID name price from products or brand is equal to some parameter B, we can modify this query by passing in whatever, foo, tick, union, and then some special union query to try to query from another table. So what am I trying to so? But what's the important thing about a union query? What does it require that the two select statements have? Yeah? The columns are the same. Yes, you need the same number of columns and possibly type depending on the system, right? which is something that if we don't know what query is actually executing is, is not something we know beforehand, but we'll see, you know, we may be able to guess a little bit depending on what output the user gives us. So for here, this would be a query for some e-commerce application that's going through and showing you all the ID names and prices of the products, right? So you would probably start with guessing at least two, a name and a price, but you may not know exactly what they are. But if you were, you'd be able to do a union select user pass null from accounts, and now you've extracted all the usernames and passwords from the accounts table, so that will be all shown in there. What else did I have to know for here? So I had to know the number of parameters, so three, yeah. Did you know the account you type the table Yeah, I needed to know this table name. So it turns out for most of the standard, it depends on the database again, but like MySQL, which we just talked about in the second most popular database, 
it has a standard table that you can query that lists all of the other tables. So you query that table, you get the other tables, you even get the column names of that table, so that's the other thing, right? We need to know the table to access and also the columns of that table. But we can access that information pretty easily. So, but now we have this problem of how do we determine the number and type of the queries parameters? So what do you think? What should we do? Uh, there's a table that gives you um, the names of the tables and columns, but we have to, like here, here we don't know. So all we know is that there's a SQL injection vulnerability somewhere in a select query that's controlling these products, but we don't know that this select statement used three columns because we have to build the union select that goes after it with the exact right number of columns. Because if we put two, it'll crash, it'll give, us, it'll give an error. If we put four, it'll give an error. Yeah? Uh, you could craft a new select statement in the union that has like a specific type of value, like just one, if you're expecting an integer, and then see if it returns that value or not. And then what do we do if it doesn't? Try a different combination. Okay, cool. So yeah, so essentially one thing we can do, so to get rid of type, we can use null. So if we use null, it doesn't matter what the type of the original value is, we can always use null. So then what we're, so now we can get rid of types for now, then now what we have to decide is how many. So essentially we just try, we start with one, we input one, does the union select with one null. If it is not correct, it'll give us a 500, it'll throw some error. If it is correct, it will show, it will, I think, add one more result with like null, null, null on there. So we try to use like null, 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 right? And for these, we don't need, we don't need a table. We don't need to select null from a certain table. So we can use this without knowing anything else. On the previous example, once we got to three, we'd say, yes, this works. Now we know exactly the number of columns. <laughs> And then we can use what Adam just said, and, um, and I'm not talking about myself in third person. Um, <laughs> um, now we need to know the type of columns, so we can use this same structure. We can use all nulls, and we can first try putting, so remember we're doing experiments, right? So we only want to modify one variable at a time. So we want to try putting a number in for the first parameter. So put maybe, well, or we can put a string there, and we can try it in different, we can try strings and integers in different uh, positions in order to understand is it a string value or an integer value. So then when we do that, we can query these database specific tables. I'm not gonna go into these, there's tons and tons of information on the internet about these, so, uh, but each of these databases has this specific one. So how do you know which database the web application's using? What was it? From the you can something. Maybe from the error message, if it tells you it's a MySQL error, let's say it doesn't tell you that, yeah. You could try using like a syntax specific keyword in your, instead of saying union, like I know MySQL doesn't have index search. Mm. Like, yes, that's a really good approach. So there's, uh, there's even. What did you say? Syntax? Yes, yeah, so each, so SQL is a standard that I, believe most of the databases should support in, a same, in the same way. But each of them, Oracle, MS SQL, MySQL, have database specific functions, technology, syntax even. Uh, in MySQL, there's even a, a database specific comment. So you could comment, make a comment, and only if it's MySQL will it actually realize that's a comment. So you would input something that maybe was uh, alters and messed up the query parsing. If it was other databases, if it's MySQL, it parses it correctly. And so you'd be able to tell by testing which database it is. You can also try querying these tables too. You can try, once you have the, the union query, you can try querying these. So typically, and so this, 
becomes the basis of your SQL injection attack. So now we've widened it up to any SQL injection on a select statement. We can now extract all of the, ta all of the tables, columns, and rows in your database, which is something that's terrifying. So this is why uh, on the web, uh, cross-site scripting is still more prevalent than SQL injection. So SQL injection is not as prevalent now, but it, because of the impact, one SQL injection vulnerability allows you to access everything. So Albert Gonzalez, the hacker that we talked about way back in the beginning of class, who the feds claim stole $242 million uh, through hacking uh, Heartland payment systems and TJ Maxx, they use SQL injection vulnerabilities to get in and to extract those credit cards. So one thing you may think of is, hey, as a defensive measure, I'm not going to output any errors. Right? I'm not going to change the page at all on if the SQL query failed or not. Or well, maybe you can't do that. But I'm going to completely disallow any error messages. So the question then becomes, well, is this enough? Right? So Further than actual, um, more so than hiding the, uh, what's what I'm looking for? More so than hiding the error messages, what if you don't even see the result? Well, that's a, actually a separate issue. Okay, we'll get to that one in a second. Uh, but let's say we can't, we can't see any error messages, right? So let's say there's a news site, we access press releases through this ID equals five parameter, a SQL query is sent to the database, which is exactly what we want. Select title description from press releases where ID equals five. What's different about this one than the other ones we looked for? What is it? Yes, one of the parameters is integer five. What's different about this query that's being sent than the other ones we looked at? What was it? Through a URL parameter, but the other ones were too, you can assume they were. But what's different about the query itself? We are getting only a handful of information. Title and description. Only one value. It's not doing a select star, what else? Yeah. We're getting only one value. My ID is equal to five things. So it only has one value. Oh, so let's say this is the one it created, so from our user input. So it's not hard coded at five. It's using our input. Quotes. Quotes. Single quotes. Our input's not in single quotes. So this is actually something that we need to think about when we're testing for this, right? So this is a great example of a SQL injection vulnerability that does not need single quotes because of the way the query is written itself. Okay, so you can query for something like three plus two and make sure that it got you page five and then that will tell you that it's vulnerable. Okay, so all error messages are filtered by the application. So, so A, we have a thing where it's only fetching from the database one page, right? So fundamentally, we can't try to extract additional pages with the union. Well, okay, that's a bad example. Um, so fundamentally, we don't get any error messages. So we want to be able to still extract information from this database. And so we first maybe try injecting five and one equals one. So we have to make sure this is all URL encoded properly. But if we inject in five and one equals one, what should that return to us? The same result. As the same result, exactly. Just, it creates this query. So it, it should be returned. So in this way, we can tell if it should be returned. So we know that if we append and one equals one to a query, it's always going to be true. But when we're injecting other statements, we don't have any other information. We can't extract other information from these statements. So what we know is if the same record is returned, if that 
page of five is returned, then the statement must be true. So essentially, what we can do, we can, we can ask binary questions of the SQL server. So if you think about it, what we're getting back for every request we make to the server, we're getting back one bit of information. Because we can put a complex Boolean condition, and then we can say end one equals one, and we know that if that whole thing is true, it's true, then we'll get that, that article five. If not, we'll get an error, a simple error page. And what does that tell us? So, in a sec. So, for example, we can ask the server something like, is the current user's name hacker? Right? Press release five and username equals hacker. So the response to this will tell us yes or no if that's true. But this is super useless, right? Because this is something we just have to guess and randomly poke. You know, we may be able to say something like, uh, does, uh, is the uh, user, well, is there a table that exists called users? You could ask a question like that. And you could say that, does there exist a user in that users table named admin? But what we can do is we can actually use super interesting binary search in order to extract information from the database. So what you do is you make a query, so we know which, um, we know which table queries uh, has the list of usernames and columns. Sorry, the list of tables and columns. You would query that database and you'd say, uh, if the first record and you, in SQL, you have these really complicated uh, functions that you can use. So you can say things like if the substring, the first character of the first row, is less than, what's in the middle of the alphabet? M or N? M? If it's less than M, right, that would be your conditional. So you know true or false, you've just limited the first character's input range. So you can do that binary search on the first character until you find the exact value. Then you can do that for the second character, third character, fourth character. You keep doing that until you figure out the for one table name and you keep doing that. Obviously you would not want to do this as a human because that's horrible, but you'd write a program that's able to do this. So you can do things like this. So this would tell you if the username, the first uh, value of the username is less than, let's say, question mark. And then that would hone you in on exactly what the value is. So it's classic binary search. But you can do this all 100% automatically. And using this, by just being able to extract one bit of information from the database, you can dump everything, the entire database. So you can dump all of the tables, all the columns, all of the data from the database using just this one bit of information. It's a really powerful thing. And it's actually automated in, there are automatic tools to do this for you, so you don't have to do it manually. Or write your own. But you know how you could do it if you had to. So you'd have to, it's basically brute forcing it in a way. Brute forcing in a smart way, yes. So you brute force it essentially bite by bite. You check, is it, do you have this, do you have this, do you have yes. this, do you have this. A series of queries. It's like, um, Playing that game, what's that game? Like something 20 questions? It's like playing 20 questions, but with an infinite number of questions. And so you can just keep asking questions that narrow down the space of what the value is until you know exactly what each of the value is. Cool. So this is one super interesting type of SQL injection vulnerabilities, the blind SQL injection technique. The other interesting areas are second order SQL injections. So the idea is your input is injected into the application and it's put in the database securely, right? So there's no SQL injection when the data goes into the database, but later on, somewhere else in the application, that data is pulled out of the database and used in a SQL query, unsanitized. Because the developer is erroneously assuming that the data had already been sanitized before it was put in the database and that it's safe to use but fundamentally it's not. So you think of things like, maybe there's a guest book that users can put their username and passwords, 
Um, and then there's statistics run over those about how many, I don't know, users do something. And those queries use the user input. So this is important because even if the application escapes single quotes, right, and does everything correctly, there can still be SQL injection vulnerabilities. So yeah, another way where this comes up that's pretty uh, interesting is would be in like a password changing form. So let's say the user sets their username to be uh, John tick 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 uh, John tick dash dash. So the application safely escapes it when it gets put into the database. So now the database holds the value John single quote dash dash. Now, if the attacker changes their password and they're, they're using the username from the database as part of the query, now we've altered this second query's semantics and syntax and are able to change it and do whatever we want. So let's do something like this. Like a registered page where we're inserting into users the username and password. And so here we're using, even though we're concatenating strings together, we're using the PHP function MySQL real escape string, which is the way to prevent SQL injection vulnerabilities in MySQL. <laughs> so then I'm changing password. So now we get the password. We then issue a query to get the username and password from the user's table. We then fetch it and then we update the update the user's password. And you can see here that like the developer thought about escaping things, right? They thought, oh, this new password comes from the post request, so it's definitely dangerous. I need to escape this. But does not escape the username because, hey, it came from the database, right? So it should be fine. So fundamentally, SQL injections are very, and I'll, I'll also mention here for second order SQL injection, you can also take this to nth order SQL injection where Data comes from one database into maybe another table, into another query, into another thing, and then is used unsanitized. So you fundamentally, essentially you should, just, you should never trust user input. Anytime, anything, you're anywhere thinking that could potentially be user input or could be in the future, you should escape it before it goes into the database, into a query. So how to solve this, right? Well, it's easy. You just completely sanitize every single place where any possible user input can ever touch the database, which actually is insane, right? I mean, you think about how many places that happens, it's almost all of the places. The other way to do this is stored procedures. And this is the, fundamentally the, um, yes, OK, no, I was getting my them mixed up, yeah. So stored procedures, anybody use stored procedures before? Yeah, what, what database? MS SQL. MS SQL, yeah, they're a huge way of doing that, right? So with MS SQL, you write all the functions that you need and store them in the database, and you just call those functions. The best way to do this is really with prepared statements. So the idea is, you pass the string of the query you want to make to the database first. The database parses the query, and then you say, and this is the data that I want to be used. So in essence, let's go back here. In essence, you would pass, and we'll see the exact example, but you'll essentially pass select star from pubs where username equals data to come later, and password equals <coughs> data to come later. So the SQL server will then create this tree without any user input. Then when you say, hey, here's data zero, here's data one, it will put that into the proper places, and the SQL server knows that that data should never change the parsing of that. So it works something like this. Like you call a prepare statement, and you say select star from user for username equals colon name, and password is equal to SHA-1, concatenate, password assault, limit one. So does this string ever change? Is there any way an attacker can influence this string that gets passed as a prepared statement?
change the username to that? How? Using the uh, URL. Using super global. What gets passed to the prepare function? What's the type of the? A string. What's the value of that string? It's exactly this string right here. It is never, ever a different string, right? You're, so you can look at it, you can see there's no dollar signs in this string, so we're not doing any of that string interpretation or anything like that. We're not concatenating anything with this string. This string will always be passed to the, to the prepare function exactly the same no matter what input the user gives. And this is why it is fundamentally secure. So that now the database will, create, will analyze it, parse it, create the parsing tree, and then later you bind this name parameter to the value of dollar sign name which came from the user. The same thing with the password as dollar sign password which came from the user. Then you have to tell the database to execute that query. Then you can operate on the results. Yes. Would you uh, hash that phrase? And if it hashes correctly, then you know no one's manipulated the phrase. The string? No, you couldn't talk. Correct. Any other questions? Prepared statement. What's the downside here? Limits you somehow. You have to do like four times the work, man. It's, it's like so easy to just do like query, dollar sign user, dollar sign name. Like so much more easier than to do it correctly. Yeah. But uh, if we use this, uh, the compiler will compile the structure only once. Correct. If I have millions of queries like this, the uh, compiler will have to just uh, find a parameter, not a, and not actually pass and compile it. So I think this would be faster. Depends on how smart it is. I don't know if you can reuse prepared statements in different areas. It's basically wherever you would use a normal query, you would use it in this way first. So you still have the same number of queries throughout your application. You could think that the your programming language could be smart, right? It could like capture something these queries around. But yeah, that would be interesting to try to save space. You also can sanitize input, but as you can see, I put this down farther because it's very difficult to properly sanitize every single input. It's very easy to make mistakes, and only one mistake will allow you to completely control this. Yes, and uh, Is it not for the vulnerability to commits? Well, that is commits? It is not because the SQL query has already parsed it, so it knows that data what you're passing here is only data for this name parameter. You can think of it like variables. You're setting a variable called name. It's not reparsing that name. 